Special Agent Mitchell, FBI. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 things Judas and the Black Messiah got factually right. At one point for me, he was like a role model. The Black Panthers are the single greatest threat to our national security. Alex Rackley? <laughs> no, he did. For this list, we're looking at plot points from this biopic that remained faithful to the lives of Fred Hampton, William O'Neill, and everyone in between. In case you haven't seen this powerful film yet, keep in mind there will be spoilers. What did you think of Judas and the Black Messiah? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. William O'Neill was a car thief. FBI. FBI, that's right. When we're introduced to O'Neill, he poses as an FBI agent who uses his fake badge to steal a car. The guys at the pool hall catch on to O'Neill's ruse, leading to his arrest. Although a few liberties are taken, it's not too far from the truth. According to O'Neill, he stole a car with a buddy one night. They drove it to Michigan, and after shooting some pool, the two had an accident and took a bus back to Chicago. My recruitment by the FBI was very efficient, very simple, really. Um, I'd stole a car and uh, went joyriding over the state limit. While O'Neill wasn't arrested on the spot, he was contacted by FBI agent Roy Martin Mitchell a few months later about the stolen vehicle. Tell me, why the badge? Why not just use a knife or a gun like a normal? Car thief. Mitchell eventually told O'Neill that the charges against him would be dropped if he infiltrated the Black Panther Party. Number 9. Free Breakfast for Children Evening, brothers and sisters. I wanted to hip you all to a new free breakfast program over on the south side next week. Although the FBI painted Fred Hampton as a criminal, his goal was to make the world a better place. One of the many ways he did this was through the Free Breakfast for Children program, as seen in the movie. Launched by the Black Panther Party, the program fed thousands of hungry children on a daily basis. The Illinois Black Panther Party has a mandate to feed every hungry kid in Chicago. In addition to organizing five breakfast programs in Chicago's West Side, Hampton aspired to help provide free medical services. Nevertheless, the FBI claimed that the breakfast program served as a way to brainwash children, falsely calling it, quote, nefarious activity. Come on in, little brother. Come on in, little sister. Down Authorities would raid the program, even while kids were eating. Not long after Hampton's death, Black Panther co-founder Huey P. Newton would emphasize the importance of the breakfast program. Y'all don't see these kids in here? Huh? Of course you're gonna wait till you get to a free breakfast program post something like this. Bunch of cowards. Number eight, Jake Winter's death. We educate, we nurture, we feed, and we lobby. Perhaps we're here for more than just war with these bodies. One of the Black Panther members prominently depicted in the film is Spurgeon Jake Winters. In an especially tense sequence, an armed Jake finds himself in a shootout with the cops. At least two officers are shot dead before Jake is gunned down. Winters did indeed die during a police shootout on November 13, 1969, less than a month before Hampton met his tragic end. Officers John J. Gilhooley and Frank G. Rappaport reportedly died during the gunfight as well. Whereas Winters acts alone in the film, reports suggest that fellow Panther Lawrence Lance Bell was also present, although he was only wounded. In his memory, the Panthers named a free medical clinic after Winters. Number 7. O'Neill Worked Closely with Roy Mitchell Special Agent Mitchell, FBI While Mitchell reportedly had nine Black Panther informants prior to the December 1969 raid, O'Neill easily had the biggest impact. Actors Lakeith Stanfield and Jesse Plemons do an authentic job at capturing their dynamic. Or you can go home. As the film depicts, Mitchell wasn't just O'Neill's main contact at the FBI. O'Neill visited Mitchell's house, met his young child, and even had dinner with him. Developing a relaxed rapport, O'Neill went as far as to describe Mitchell as, quote, a role model. At one point for me, he was like a role model. According to U.S. District Judge Charles Kokoris, quote, he became like a father to O'Neill, and he trusted Roy at a time when not many people trusted anybody. The two collaborated on the floor plan for Hampton's apartment, earning O'Neill a $300 bonus. Hey, Roy boy, how are you? Number six, Hampton was arrested over ice cream. Uh, he was uh, accused of uh, taking uh, 70 something dollars worth of 
ice cream. According to O'Neill, the FBI attempted to find evidence of Hampton doing drugs, but they never could because he was clean. Hampton would face jail time, however, over $71 worth of ice cream bars. In late May, Fred Hampton was sent to prison. He had been convicted on a charge of stealing $71 worth of ice cream bars. He was accused of stealing from a Good Humor ice cream van in Maywood. Hampton testified that he wasn't at the scene of the crime, telling reporters out of court, quote, I may be a pretty big mother, but I can't eat no 710 ice cream bars. Nevertheless, he was convicted and sentenced to two to five years, a punishment Hampton found excessive and unfair. Hampton didn't serve the full time, as he was eventually released on an appeal bond. Show some discipline. Tell Russia to get me a lawyer. Eight days before Hampton's death, the Illinois Supreme Court affirmed the conviction. Number five, J. Edgar Hoover's Vendetta. Martin Sheen portrays FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover as a ruthless figure who will stop at nothing to get Hampton off the streets. I want him off the street, charge him with something, anything, but get his black ass off the street. Sheen's chilling performance isn't exaggerated. Hoover called the Black Panther Party, quote, the greatest threat to the internal security of the country. The Black Panthers are the single greatest threat to our national security, more than the Chinese, even more than the Russians. He also issued a directive to, quote, prevent the rise of a messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement. The FBI labeled Hampton a, quote, radical threat, despite lacking evidence to back up such claims. Hampton wasn't the only prominent African-American activist Hoover monitored, keeping a close eye on Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali as well. Through COINTELPRO, a, quote, dirty tricks program, Hoover targeted the Nation of Islam and Martin Luther King Jr.'s Southern Christian Leadership Conference, along with the Panthers. Number four, attack on Panther office. During Hampton's incarceration for the ice cream robbery, the police raided a Black Panther office. This snowballed into a shootout, although we're not sure if O'Neill was present as the film suggests. While Fred Hampton was in prison, a police raid on the Panther office turned into a shootout. In any case, five officers and three Panthers were injured, but nobody died. In addition to making arrests, the authorities purposely left the office in a fiery state of disarray to send a message. At the encouragement of Black Panther co-founder Bobby Seale, the office was reopened shortly after, and the party began to rebuild. The community banded together to fix the building up, and soon enough, the office was back in business. Open it up, take all that boarding down, paint that place, and the Black Panther Party members start working for a couple of days. The next thing you know, the community start bringing wood, paint, and everything, and open that Black Panther Party office right back up. Number three, George W. Sams Jr. was behind Alex Rackley's death. George Sams, security captain for the New Haven chapter. According to the film, Sams and Rackley also infiltrated the Black Panther Party. Although Sams and Rackley were both accused of secretly working with the authorities, this remains unconfirmed. Either way, Judas and the Black Messiah was right about Rackley's grim fate. Sams had Rackley kidnapped and tortured for two days at the New Haven Panther office. At Sams' request, fellow Panthers Warren Kimbrough and Lonnie McLucas shot Rackley dead. Alex Rackley? <laughs> no, he did. Well, he claims two other guys with the trigger men, but what's he gonna say? During the 1970 New Haven Black Panther trials, Sams testified that he acted on Bobby Seale's orders. No additional evidence of Seale's involvement was found, but he was arrested and tried with Erica Huggins. Ultimately, Seale and Huggins were acquitted, while Sams and Kimbrough were convicted. McLucas was also acquitted, save a conspiracy charge. Number two, O'Neill was asked to drug Hampton. I'll put that in his drink. In addition to drawing the floor plan for Hampton's apartment, O'Neill is instructed to give him barbiturates prior to the film's climactic raid. Check this out, man. I got this article I want you to read, right? Yeah, right? It's an article in this paper. Very important. I need you to let the chairman read it tomorrow night. During a 1989 interview, shortly before taking his own life, O'Neill was asked if Hampton had been drugged. O'Neill denied this, saying, quote, Fred was the type of person that you didn't have to drug anyway. Fred was always tired. However, barbiturates were found in Hampton's blood. O'Neill was at Hampton's apartment for a late dinner and left around 1.30 a.m. My mistake. Articles and shit, man. No, no, it's all good. It's, it's my mistake. No, I, I guess I had the wrong guy. Sorry about that. Hampton was in the middle of talking to his mother on the phone when he suddenly fell asleep. Not long after, the raid commenced. Before we unveil our top pick, here are some honorable mentions. 
Deborah Johnson's pregnancy. She was more than eight months pregnant when tragedy struck. Hampton negotiated pacts. He sought to peacefully unite Chicago's gangs. Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois Black Panther Party. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, Fred Hampton's death. Coming. Like the trial of the Chicago Seven, Judas and the Black Messiah is accurate in its depiction of Hampton's death. At 4 a.m. on December 4, 1969, a team of police officers arrived at Hampton's Monroe Street residence. On December 4th, at 4.45 in the morning, 14 policemen, nine white and five black, raided the apartment. 45 minutes later, they stormed the apartment with several Panthers inside. Mark Clark, who stood guard with a shotgun, was killed as the heavily armed cops riddled the apartment with bullets. A sedated Hampton slept on a mattress with Deborah Johnson, who was pulled out of their room by the authorities. As the team entered Hampton's bedroom, two additional shots could be heard. According to Johnson, one officer said, quote, he's good and dead now. Hampton died at age 21, but his legacy would live on. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.